Hi, I'm Scott Stevens, lead pastor of Northway Christian Community. I'm excited you're here to listen to this message from our teaching team. I'm also excited that you are intentionally seeking to grow in your relationship with Jesus. By watching this message, our hope is your faith will be challenged as you learn more about who God is and how much He loves each and every one of us. However, watching or listening to a message is just one part of spiritual growth. In addition to being challenged by a message, I believe it's so important to be part of a local church community. At a local church, you can develop friendships and insights with other believers and also help to connect with those who are searching for God and not yet following Jesus. So, whether it is Northway or, or one of the other great churches throughout the Pittsburgh region, or if you're watching from some other part of the world, please consider taking this step toward being part of a local church. And if you do visit Northway, I want you to know that we are a church community that is passionate about learning to love people where we live and work and play. And there is certainly room for you at all of our Pittsburgh locations. Visit our website at northway.org for all the details. Hey folks, enjoy the message and we hope to see you soon. Ice cream. Good morning, everyone. So glad to see you. It's always an honor to be with you and so thankful and that the leadership allows us to, to have time like this together. And um, I'm excited about what God's going to do and how uh, the, the word he's got for us today. Just to give you a little heads up, it's not going to be like a typical uh, sermon, if you will. When we're in a series called Storytellers, I'd like to take some time and actually share some stories. So some of these stories that you may hear today uh, are going to be some things that I, that's personally impacted my life, that I've seen with my own two eyes, that I've touched and felt with my own hands and, and heard with my ears, and um, and I'll, I'll share some of those uh, stories, and then there'll also be a couple of stories that um, maybe didn't actually uh, uh, happen to me, but I've actually heard someone else's story. The crazy thing throughout this whole time is I'd like for you to pay attention to the times that we talk about those stories. When you hear a story, what does it do to you? What does it do in you? Does it connect with you? Do you find yourself going, man, I could relate with that one, or I could relate with that person. I've been there. I've done that. That's the whole premise of this whole message, of the reason why we need to hear each other's story and we need to share one another's story is because somewhere, somewhere someone has gone through something that have allowed them to have an experience to where they've seen and experienced the work of Christ in their life to, to make them or help them come through something, and it's that work of success that someone else needs to hear. Does that make sense? So in Revelation chapter 19, um, verse 10, it says that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That sounds really religious and really deep, and really it actually is, but to make it as simple, because I'm pretty much just a simple man, to make it as simple as possible is this, the testimony of Jesus. Every time that you share your story about the work of Christ in your life, doesn't have to be just salvation and how you got saved, but every time Jesus has stepped in and accomplished something in your life, maybe he's helped you financially, Maybe he's been your provider. Maybe he's been a healer to you. Maybe he's been a deliverer and set you free from the bondage of addiction. Whatever it might have been, every time you share your story of the work of Christ in your life, it opens up, is a spirit of prophecy, it opens up the door of opportunity for the exact same thing that happened in your life to happen in the life of someone else. So can you imagine if you've been addicted to drugs for 20, 30 years, and you can't seem to break loose. If you hear a story of someone who has been where you are, but they've got out of it, and they're sober, and they're free, and they're happy, and their family's been restored, relationships have been restored, can you imagine the hope that would stir within your heart that you'd want to hear that guy's story. You want to hear how did you do it? What in the world did you do? What program worked for you? To be able to hear the message of hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you've been that desperate, you'll chase after it. And you want to hear it. 
and it'll change your life. So the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, it's really amazing. Pastor Kent last week did an amazing job of unpacking that word testimony of what it meant in the Greek of the New Testament was written in Greek. And so the Greek word for testimony is, means to the evidence is to give evidence, right? It's amazing that in the Hebrew, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and the Hebrew counterpart to that word testimony is a word that actually means repeatable, to be repeatable or to do all over again, to do it again. So if you think about it, the testimony of Jesus being a, being a spirit of prophecy. In, in the Old Testament, what would happen is they didn't have like emails and, and journals online that you could shoot things back and forth to try to remember things. The way that they remembered things was they continued to tell the story over and over and over again. So that generations after Moses had led the people out of the bondage of slavery, they would understand and remember the story because of the story been told over and do it again and over and over again. So generations, and when the Bible says this, that generations, one generation will declare your works to the next generation. It wasn't just saying something that's really cool, something to be repeatable. What it was saying was literally, it's so important that you share the story of how God stepped in, saved you, delivered you, set you free, and that you share it over and over again so that one generation will remember his works, will remember that he's good, and remember because why? Because every generation, every life, will go through trials. I love the word that Pastor Kent gave just a while ago over communion about how, man, he is so good, but it doesn't mean it's not gonna be difficult. In my darkest hour, if you will, um, I heard a man, was, I, I went looking for stories. You may not uh, believe this, but sometimes the people on this stage are actually normal. <laughs> not supernatural superheroes, all right? <laughs> we are just like you. It sounds so dumb for me to say that, but there's been, it, it's just, there's times and trials that we go through, mountains and valleys. And in one of the darkest hours, I remember reading the book of a man who was going through a wilderness and how he got out of his wilderness season. He was a pastor going through a deep, dark wilderness season. And he shared this one statement in the book and it helped me to shift from where I was going and what I was feeling into giving me some hope for how I could get out of it. And he said this, it was meant to be difficult, but it's not impossible. And if you think about it, even back to the cross of Jesus Christ, the testimony of Jesus on the cross, the father maybe looked down at him possibly to say, yes, I, I hear you, son, I hear your cries. This was meant to be difficult, but it's not impossible. And maybe you're here today and you're going through a deep, dark time. Maybe it feels so difficult. You don't know if it's possible to make it out. Life was meant to be difficult, but it's not impossible. And you can't experience the joy. Why? Because I've been there. I've done that. I've experienced it. We have a story to tell. So the testimony of Jesus is, a, is the spirit of prophecy. So in the Old Testament, they would also, the other reason why it was so important that they would do it again, that would keep telling the story, is because in one day, you may have a situation and about three years later, you don't remember what God did in that situation. Sometimes the things that he's done in the past, if we could remember it, will help us in the present to look forward to the future. Does that make sense? So for example, um, one time Colette and I, we'd just been married a, a little bit over a year, I guess, and we'd just moved to Amarillo, Texas. Um, I was traveling full-time in, in a, a itinerant ministry type of deal. We would go and do uh, camps and conferences and things like that. And our ministry, our salary, our way of living was solely dependent upon the funding and the donations of our donors as well as the honorariums of which we went to minister at. So every event that we would go to. Well, during this one season, I wasn't traveling very often. There were some things that just happened in, in our life. We were getting ready for a baby. Things were happening. Life happens. Wasn't traveling that often. Our donations had gone down a little bit as well. And we found ourselves a couple of months behind in a bill or two, <laughs> or three. And we had one month to pay $5,800. We had a $5,800 bill that we had to pay in the, in the ministry. And we had one month. And if we didn't pay that off, it had gotten to the point that something was going to be lost or something was going to be taken away. It was, it was a, a nervous moment. 
Colette and I began to pray the scriptures. We would confess the word of God together. Every night we would pray together and go through these scriptures about financial pros uh, prosperity and, and pro provision and how God has got a plan for our life and his promise is to provide for our lives. And as we did that, as we went through that, guess what happened? First week, <laughs> nothing. Second week, nothing, right? Third week, we don't know how it's gonna change. Listen. We're looking, I started, I got a, a part-time job at UPS loading trailers. We, I mean, we were doing everything that we could do to try to help get the money in, but we needed to pay the bill and we were crying out to the Lord. Then all of a sudden, one week before the bill was due, um, we received a phone call from a buddy of mine from Abilene, Texas. And he was like, hey, Billy Bob, we're driving through Amarillo, going on a family vacation to Colorado. Listen, this is gonna sound pretty crazy. He goes, but we just bought a brand new van and we've got this other van that's in really good shape. But my wife and I felt like God told us that we we're supposed to give you a van. Are you in need of a van? I wasn't in need of a van. I needed some money, you know what I'm saying? Like, what are you doing? Did we pray wrong? What's going on? I mean, the stress was real. And I was like, buddy, I gotta be real honest, man. It's very gracious of you. And I appreciate that. But man, we really don't need a van. What we need is finances. Like we're a little bit behind and I just would really need some finances. Would you be okay if you donated your van, if we turned right around and sold that mug and then we could maybe pay off the bills that we have or whatever. And he goes, man, I don't care what you would wanna do with it. All I care about is be obedient to Christ. And he said, we need to give you the van. So we're driving through Amarillo, we'll be there in a couple hours. What, can we just drop off the van with you? Well, yes, please, come on. We didn't have a clue about what shape this van was in, how much money we could get for it or whatever, but we had a ray of hope. A little bit, a uh, couple hours later, he drives through Amarillo, stops off. We do the whole exchange. He gives us this little minivan. It was awesome. Uh, drove it around, put the mug in the paper. I keep calling it the mug, sorry. Put the van in the paper. And then three days later, we sold it for $6,000. Praise the Lord. If you've ever been there, you know the feeling of that weight being lifted. Oh, we made it, right? Oh, I couldn't believe it. It felt so difficult and it felt nearly impossible, but the Lord is the Lord of impossibilities. He's never late. He's not very ever early. He's always right on time, right? And plus he gave us $200 extra to put in our pocket. That's how he works. And those stories like that help to give hope because some of us in this room may be going through a financial difficulty right now and you were desperate to hear a story like that. And he sees you just the way he saw us and he hears you the way that he heard us. He can and will step in. There is hope. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Every time you share your story about the work of Christ in your life, it opens up the door of opportunity to happen in the same way to the, to, to the people that you're telling your story with. So, but Billy Bob, I've never like shared my story. Uh, I'm not really sure uh, of what's going on. Um, here's three things to keep in mind as you prepare to share your story, how to prepare to share your story. Um, number one, you've got to be free. I knew it, free. You gotta be free. You gotta be free. What does that mean to be free? It's this, listen, I was so amazed when Pastor Kent was preaching last week in the middle of his sermon, he made one small little announcement and he was like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching you this week on the why that we need to share a story. But next week, Pastor Billy Bob's gonna be here and he's gonna be preaching on the how. I'm right at that moment, my phone starts going off and I receive text messages from people. I mean, these guys are champions. They're like, like home run hitters in the kingdom of God. And they're like, hey man, Pastor Kent just said that you're like preaching on how. Remember to remind the people not to say it this way and not to do it this way and remind the people that if they're in a place that situation it's going to have to be like this and please don't I got like two or three text messages and he hadn't even finished preaching yet it was like amazing and I wasn't bothered by it because I love it every Every single time that I hear from those champions, every single time that I hear from you is, man, hey, God put this on my heart. Maybe you want to consider adding this in your sermon or whatever it might be. Please continue to do that. I feel all that it's great. It's an encouragement to me. So please don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not being disrespectful or I'm not condemning or anything like that to the people that have done that. But it was just amazing because then later on that afternoon when I got home and I had my email, I checked up my email, I had several email from several other people that were awesome 
also, out of the goodness of their heart, offering some suggestions. Remember, as we tell our people how to tell the stories, not to do it this way, but to do it this way. And not to say that, but to do this. Not to do that and do this. And it was back and forth. And all of a sudden, I started feeling this weight. The weight of performance. That there's a way that I have to do it. And there's a way that I, I can't do it. And if I don't do it right, it's going to fail. And if I fail, well, if you're talking about sharing your story and somebody possibly getting saved, people are going to go to hell because of me, right? And the pressure to perform is starting to get so much. And what I wanted to explain to you is this. Those guys, the people that have been sharing all that amazing wisdom with me, they're home run hitters in the kingdom of God. They've shared their story now for a long time. They've been doing this. They're pros at this. They understand. They've learned over the season how to share their story, what has helped them in the past, what has hurt them in the past. And they've learned that. And so, but I'm not talking to them this week. I'm talking to people like me and like you that maybe we've not even stepped into a batting cage, much less onto the baseball field. We don't know what it feels like just to hold the bat in our hands. And what I wanted to do is just give a couple of small suggestions to help us to be free. Don't worry about what to say and how to say it and what language to use and what tone. And if it's three minutes long or two minutes long, or if it's gotta be 30 seconds alone, don't worry about all that. You were there. You remember what it felt like when Jesus came in and he saved you. He provided for you, he healed you, he delivered you, he helped you. You were there. Just tell him what you saw, what you felt. Amen. There is no need for performance because what's gonna happen is we need to have the understanding of grabbing a hold of the bat, stepping up into the plate, feeling what it feels like. We need to step into a batting cage and have some machine like throw us like a little lob ball, not a fast ball. And we don't have to worry about even, are we gonna hit a home run or make connection at all? All we have to worry about is taking a swing at sharing our story. Does that make sense? So be free, be free. The number, second thing we need to do is we need to be alert. We need to ask and seek and knock. We need to just listen and feel the, 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 the nudges of the Holy Spirit and pay attention to those little nudges that the Holy Spirit gives you when you're in a conversation. Another story, um, really good friend of mine uh, goes here to Northway, shared a story. He's a pilot uh, and he was in a, I don't know how this works, so forgive me, but co-pilot and pilot, they were, piloting together in a plane and the, 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 main, the, the, the main pilot was, was talking about a, a particular story. I'm going to get some of the details wrong, but the, the particular story of a pastor and his wife um, that had been going through some hard times and they were in the news again, kind of a deal or whatever. And he just kind of sarcastically made a comment about like, can you believe this kind of stuff? And that people actually, you know, believe in this or put their faith in this kind of stuff or whatever. And my, my friend was, who was the co-pilot made a comment about how, um, he just felt like the Holy Spirit put a nudge. This is an opportunity to share a story, to share something, to say something. And my buddy said that in that moment, he was a little bit nervous, but he said, you know, um, it's true, man. That's exactly the reason why we cannot afford to put our faith in men. Because men will always fail us. But we have to put our faith and our trust in Jesus because he is the only one who will never fail us. A small little nudge from the Holy Spirit. He shared one small little snippet out of his heart of what he felt like he was doing. You know what happened? He said that the, the, main, the, the main pilot, the, co the, the, the other pilot, the, the, the other guy that was in the little room on the airplane, said that he turned to him and he said, all these years I've been wanting somebody to explain that to me. And it's been so difficult for people to even express, but you've just cleared it up and it made a lot of sense to me in just five sentences. That makes a lot, of, a lot of sense. I can't remember what happened or if anything, if he accepted Christ or anything like that in that moment. But can you see how one small little story, one small little falling, following of the Holy Spirit nudges helped to have somebody turn and change the trajectory, the direction of their life and the way of thinking that maybe I could look into Jesus a little bit more. You don't have to hit a home run every time. Just take a swing and see what happens. So you wanna be free, you wanna be alert, and then lastly, please be real. 
Be authentic. Just be you. Have you ever been to one of those things like you're hanging out at a guy's house or you're at a party or whatever and you're like, what's up, bro? And you guys are all talking like normal. But then when Jesus comes up, it's like changes into like Elizabethan, like King James language. Oh, well, bless you, brother. <clears throat> If thou would allow me to pray for you, if I would love to shower down a blessing upon you and your family, right? And they change. They change into like this religious like person. And it's like, what happened to Bob? Where did he go, right? It's like, listen, just be real. You don't have to worry about trying to make it. And sometimes, listen, you're going to be like my brother, Chris, who every time he goes fishing, like Pastor Kent said, but the reality is like, Bill, you're not going to believe it. I caught this fish this big. You got to come over and see it. And you go over there and look at it. It's like a little rainbow perch. It's like, what are you doing? You don't have to embellish the church. Sometimes we have a tendency to step into our past to try to embellish our stories as if we're going to try to help God out to communicate how big he is. He don't need no help. Listen, you were there. Just tell him what you saw. Tell him what you experienced. Tell him how it felt. Use the language you typically use. It's going to be just fine. You are enough and you have what it takes. Just be you. Be real. Be authentic. It will be okay. But Billy Bob, I've never shared my story before. How do I even know how to start? Where do I begin? First of all, you just think about it. Take some time, think about it. I love doing this, and I promise you, if you do this, this will happen to you. If you're driving down the road, if you're at your house, you take a little time of quietness, maybe in your next quiet time or something you're having with the Lord, doesn't matter where it is or whatever, but just ask him, say, Father, would you bring back to remembrance, would you bring back to my memory a time and a place where you stepped in and you helped me so that I can remember and give you praise and maybe remember a story in my life that you worked? It could be the salvation moment. It could be a time where he provided for you financially. It could be whatever, any time, any, I'm telling you, there's gonna be a memory that pops into your head and you're like, really? Sit with it a little bit. Remember the time when Christ came into your life. Remember the time when God showed up and he did a work in your life and he helped you in some way, shape or form. Remember what it felt like. Some of you have been through depression and there's people that you work with, that you live with, that you play with, that are in deep, deep need to hear how you got out, how you made it out. They need to know the source, the program, the software, whatever it is that helped you to get out. So you got to go back and you got to remember those dark times. Remember what it felt like to be lonely. Remember what it felt like to be lost. Remember what it felt like to be poor and with, being without. Remember what it felt like to be sick and tired of being sick and tired. Remember those times. Write it down. One way to help share is write down your story. Don't just remember what it felt like to be lost, but remember what it felt like when you asked Jesus to come and help. Remember what it felt like when I was, man, that's what I felt like, and, but what did I do? What did you do? Think about it, just remember it. For Colette and I, there were times we'd get in these places, we'd start, we'd get all the scriptures that had to do about finances or our health, and we'd put them all down and we'd quote them, we'd be praying through them for each other. And what did you do in those times? Remember it and then write it down. And then, what did Jesus do in that moment? How did he help you? What did it feel like? What did it sm smell like? What did it feel like? What, did it, what was the experience like? It could have, I guess. Uh, anyways, but then write it down. Just write it down. Writing it down doesn't necessarily just help us to like clarify our thoughts and put everything down nice and neat kind of a deal. But the other thing it does is it actually allows us to have something that we can, that we can remember Later on, we go back to our journal or we open up. I have a file in my office that I've kept several testimonies over the years of what's happened. I'd like to read one to you uh, if I brought it. Um, pause. Play. I have a file that I keep these little things and last night, this was not planned and out of the blue, I felt like the Lord, like five minutes before service, let's go up and grab one of those stories. Open it up, this is the very first one. It was written by, uh, it was an email sent to me by a guy named Justin. Uh, he's from Mesquite, Texas. Um, I won't read the whole thing, just this portion of it. He says, one more thing, Billy Bob. 
And then I'll leave you alone. It's pretty funny. Last year at Glory Camp, you were speaking to, a different, so, to different individuals about what God had showed for them. While you were doing that one of the nights, you said that someone needs to know that they have been healed from Crohn's disease. Well, I was that person that needed to hear it because I had just gotten out of the hospital and I'd been dealing with the effects of the disease for close to eight years. Now, I'd never been to any kind of camp until last year. As a youth, I played hockey for about 12 years and traveled around the States all summer long and I never went to youth camp. But now as I'm a 25-year-old sponsor, as my first time to, I went to camp for the first time last year and heard you speak those words about Crohn's disease. And I wanted to thank you for being obedient to where God leads you because my life has forever been changed because of that night. Just a couple of months ago, I had my doctor perform about five different tests. And that last one, she said, she did, she said to me, if I had not known you for the last eight years and treated you for Crohn's disease for the last eight years, based on what I see now, I would never have known that you had ever had this disease. The Lord has healed me. And I thank you again for your awesome worship times in these past two years I've gone to camp. Listen, it's a story about how Jesus stepped in and healed someone of a disease. Why is it important that we share stories like this? Because maybe some of you have a disease and they're desperate for the Lord to step in. And maybe it's gotten so difficult, you don't know if it's possible. And something like this, one person's story could give you hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, number one, write it down. Number two, the second thing we wanna do is that we want to tell a close friend or a family member. Once you write it down and you get your thoughts about your story, the, one of the greatest things you can do is you can find somebody that you trust, somebody that is a safe place that you can just go, hey, uh, this is gonna sound weird. I've been working on my story, but I wanna kinda share a story with you. Is that okay? Can I share a story? This can happen today. Please let it happen today. Around the dinner table with your family. Guys, I got a story. I just wanna share a story about how Jesus did something in my life. Is that okay? And share it. It's not to gain constructive criticism. Hey, I'm gonna share a story. Tell me, is there anything I need to work on? Anything I can make it? Do I need to like speak it in an English accent or something? You know, it's like, it's not for that purpose. What it's doing is it's simply giving you the ability and the opportunity to get into the cage and just practice swinging, just practice sharing your story. The more you practice, 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 it'll be more comfortable. It's like the first kiss, man. It's just awkward. You're scared to death. You don't know what you're doing, but once you get married and you get to kiss a whole lot, it becomes natural, right? The more that you practice, the awkwardness will leave and you'll become a home run hitter just like my buddies who have been texting and emailing me, right? They're home run hitters. They know what to do and how to share their story. It becomes second nature. So write it down, tell a close friend um, and maybe, listen, maybe you don't have someone in your life that you feel comfortable sharing it with. Here at Northway, we have a website we have an email that we want you to feel comfortable. You don't have to talk to us directly. If I, I might be a scary guy, that you might not want to approach me. I would love to hear your story. Please email me your story. But if you go to northway.org slash my story, or just simply email my story at northway.org, just type in and share us your story. That sends an email straight to me and my team. We love going through those emails because they encourage us like crazy. And just there's an opportunity to share your story with someone who is safe. And then the last thing is ask, seek, and knock. Just be attentive because once you start practicing it, God's gonna open up opportunities for you to share the story. You'll be amazed at how often you'll be thinking about, oh man, you've been thinking about financial, how God did something for you. And then later on, and I've been saying a lot about finance, is it okay so maybe there's people here today that you just need to hear the story of finances that's awesome so sorry I just jumped off a squirrel okay um <laughs> they but there's going to be opportunities once you start practicing a story around the topic of what God's put in your heart don't be surprised when you're at work you're at the ball field, you're hanging out with friends or you're at you know, your house with your family and you see an opportunity that you're hearing in a conversation. Could this be a moment that I could share my story? Take a swing. Let's see, see what happens, right? Using the everyday life stories are some of the most powerful stories. Just everyday life. 
This is, you don't even have to use like church language or even quote scripture. You don't have to unfold one of those tracks, which they're all good. I'm just saying, just be you. One time I was, uh, Colette and I, I share a lot of stories about Colette and I. She's pretty incredible. Um, but we, we had just been married for a couple of months. Uh, and for her birthday, um, uh, I bought her a German Shepherd puppy. I know. <laughs> Sounds real romantic, soft, cuddly little puppy, right? But the reason why is because really I wanted a guard dog because I was traveling a lot. We were going to train this mug into be like a special forces type of dog. He was going to be trained in protection and, and, and defense. Um, and I wanted to protect my sweet wife. So I had a buddy of mine who was in the part of the sheriff department. He was the canine officer for the sheriff department. He was a professional dog trainer. That's what he did to, to dogs, right? So he came over every so often he would come over and help me train our dog. We named our dog Benaiah. <laughs> Benaiah was the chief bodyguard of King David in the Bible. <laughs> Oh man, it was awesome, dude. It was great. He had like a natural tattoo and everything. It was cool. But, um, <laughs> but Benaiah, so we were training him. So the first thing we had to do, we started to train him in obedience, just in simple things like sit, you know, stay, you know, don't poop there, go to your kennel, that kind of stuff. We would train him on those things. But then there was a couple of months as Benaiah kept to grow, growing, he kept getting smarter and smarter and learning new things and tricks and things like that, that my buddy Troy came over and he said, hey, he says, um, has your dog ever tried to challenge you? It's like, challenge me. He's like, yeah. He says, the German shepherds are close relative to the wolf. In the wolf pack, they always had a time where they would challenge one another to establish the alpha male, who is going to be the boss of the pack, of the family. So has Benai ever challenged you? Has he ever barked at you, growled at you? You know, not, no, I mean, I could take him, but he hasn't, you know, kind of a deal. He says, well, today's the day you're going to challenge him and we're going to establish the authority of the house. I'm like, okay, how do I do that? He said, all I want you to do is reach down, grab Beniah by the hip and grab him by the jaw, flip him over and pin him down to the ground. That's all you got to do. I'm like, okay. I mean, come on. He's like a puppy. I mean, he's like, he's a big puppy now. It's been several months, but he's a puppy. And I'm like, dude, I can do that. He's like, Billy, I promise you it's going to be harder than you can imagine. And I was like, What's a little dog gonna do to me, man? You know, it's like, what? So he says, are you ready? I said, I'm ready. He goes, are you sure? I said, I'm sure. He goes, Billy, it's not, I'm like, okay, I get it. And he says, the other most important thing is once you pin him down to the ground, do not let him up until I tell you to. He says, it's the most important thing that you keep him pinned to the ground until I tell you. It's like, okay, all right, I'm ready. He says, you ready? I'm ready. Okay, go. So I reached down, grabbed him by the hip, grabbed him by the jaw, and I flipped him over and I pinned him down to the ground and I'm holding, and I'm telling you, all heck broke loose. My dog became like Arnold Schwarzenegger. He was fighting like crazy, slobbering, biting, scratching. He was yelping. I, I could tell I was causing pain and I hated it. And I'm holding him down to the ground, holding him down. It got so hard. You guys are going to think I'm so bad. But I literally had to put my knee into his belly to help pin him down to the ground. And he was fighting, fighting and fighting. And then and I looked back at Troy, my buddy. I was like, buddy, I'm, I'm hurting him. He's like, no, it's okay. He's okay. I promise you. But I'm like, I'm hurt. Is it supposed to hurt? I'm, I'm hurting him. He's like, it's supposed to. You're fine. Just don't let him up. And then all of a sudden, Benaiah stops. And he's no longer fighting. But he's just looking. I'll never forget it. His little tongue was sticking out of his mouth. And he's looking up at me with them big old eyes. And he's just, you know, like, what, what, what's going to happen kind of a deal. That's when my buddy said, okay, now let him up and love on him like you've never loved on him before. And I let him up. I mean, scratching all over and just giving him a good, good love, good love, good love. And, and then Troy goes, okay, now tell him a command, but it's got to be something that he knows. Tell him something you've taught him that he knows. Tell him a command. And I said, uh, uh, Benaiah, heal. Whew. He came up, stood right next to me, put his, you know, leaned up against my leg and sat down and looked at me like, what now, Lord, Lord Billy? What? I looked at Troy and I was like, what? Are... And then I looked at my house and I looked at my dog and I looked at my house and I said, all right, I'm going to try it. I said, Benaiah, kennel. You know what my dog did? He ran down the sidewalk, up the stairs of the front porch, through the front door, through the living room, through the kitchen. I was running behind him to see if he's going to actually do it, right? Gets into the laundry room and he's sitting in his kennel, waiting, looking at me going, what now, Lord? What now? Kind of a deal. I couldn't believe it. I walked back out and Troy's out there, you know, a big old man. He's just out there sitting down. I was like, what in the world happened? He's never been that obedient, never been that quick. 
And Troy goes, well, he says, dogs associate pain with death. If a dog is experiencing pain, he does everything he can to try to get away with it, or away from it. But if he can't, because he feels like if he can't get away from it, he's gonna surely die. But if he can't get away from it, what happened was in that moment, you were causing so much pain, he was completely out of control. You were putting so much weight on him and his life. There came a moment that he realized that he did everything in his power to get away from it and he can't do nothing. So he just surrendered and he gave up and he thought, you're gonna kill him. And he surrendered to death. He goes, but instead of killing him, you let him up and you loved on him like he ain't ever been loved on before. And now, as long as he knows what it is you want him to do, he'll do anything you ask him to do. I ain't lying. I, we are two grown men in the front porch and I'm sitting there just bawling my eyes out. Troy's like, what in the world's going on with you? I said, buddy, opportunity to share a story. I said, buddy, that's the story of my life. What are you talking about? I said, if you knew half of the things that I've done over my life, you'd probably be one of the first people to stand in front of me and say, yep, worthy of death right there. He's a bad guy. I said, you don't understand the weight of this life sometimes. It was just, it pinned me down. And over the years, it felt like Jesus, Jesus of all the people, the righteous Jesus, the holy Jesus, no one is like him. No one is, is anything close to him. And he's so pure and holy. And he is the only one that has the right to condemn death or life. And Jesus was pinning me down with his love and I couldn't get away from it because I didn't deserve it. I didn't want it. I didn't, I didn't think it was gonna help me. But in the moment that it got so hard and I knew I just had to surrender, I just surrendered and trusted my life to him. And instead of killing me, the only man who could righteously condemn me to death, instead of killing me, he let me up. And I've never experienced love like that before. And now, yeah. Oh, man. And... And I told him, and now I'll do anything he wants me to do. I'll go anywhere he wants me to go. It's good for me to share that story because sometimes I forget and I need to do it again. I need to experience it again. And I need to remember that God's with me and he loves me like he has never loved before. Maybe you're here today. Maybe you're feeling like that dog Take it from somebody who's been there. You can go down to the pit like a dog. But if you want, you can be raised up as a child and experience love like you've never felt love before. He's real. It's legit. It ain't all about the religious jargon. It's all about relationship. So maybe you're here today and you want to make that decision. I don't have a clue. I don't even know how to Accept Christ? What do you mean accept Christ? Be born again? That's why we have our elders after every service down at the front because they want to hear your story. They want to share their story. They want to help you, pray with you. And maybe you're here today and you need a financial miracle. God's going to do it. Reach out, ask him for it. I promise you, God will always come through. Maybe you have a sickness. Maybe you are addicted. You can't seem to get whatever it is of holding you bound, get free from it. God has a plan. Surrender it up. He will provide and pre perform the miracle on your behalf. He always will. He will be with you. And even though some things happen and it's not very good, it feels, it might be difficult, but it wasn't meant to be impossible. Let me pray with you. Father, I love you so much. Thank you for the stories, the stories in the Bible, stories from our neighbors and our friends, our coworkers, our family. Thank you for the stories that you've done in our life that we have to tell. Help us to tell them, God. Because sometimes we have a tendency, God, that if we feel like we have to say it right or do it wrong or do it whatever, God, that it, it becomes about our ability to share a story and we, out of fear, just end up not doing it. And therefore, someone misses an opportunity to receive hope. I just pray, God, that we would put our trust and our confidence, not in our ability to share a story, but in your ability, the one whose story is about, 
to make a change and to do something in someone's life. We love you so much. And for those people that are desperately in need of something, would you empower the hands and the hearts of our elders this morning? Thank you for the anointing that's on their life, that when they pray today, they're going to be praying in agreement with your word, with the Holy Spirit, and with one another, and we're going to see miracles take place. Finances will be provided. Health will be restored. Relationships will come together. In Jesus' name, we declare it. We love you. Amen. Amen.